Good evening, everybody. We're delighted to welcome you all to the Royal Irish Academy for tonight's discourse, Why Are There So Few Women Political Leaders? So I'm Professor Pat Guyery, the newly elected president of the Royal Irish Academy, about two weeks into the job. So please give me your attendance, please. Oh, no. Oh, no. I, I was, sorry. <laughs> I thought I wasn't looking for an applause, it was just to say, <laughs> if I make a mistake, it's because it's just I'm new to the job, that's all. Um, also present here this evening is the Academy Secretary, Mary O'Dowd, to my right, and our Executive Director, Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan. Academy discourses are the oldest and most renowned series of talks in Ireland. The first discourses were presented in 1786, the year the Academy was founded. Historically, they were the occasion reserved for the most distinguished academics to first reveal and discuss their work in public. We now record these discourses in the 21st century, and they are available on the Academy's website. Before we begin, uh, we have some short Academy business to undertake, so if I can have your patience with those, please. The minutes of our last discourse, The Critical University, by outgoing President Dr. Mary Canning on the 28th of February 2023, were posted online. Since our members did not inform us of any issues with these minutes, I will take these as approved and will sign the minute book after discourse dis concludes. It is my pleasure to welcome our esteemed speakers for this evening's discourse. So I'll go from my right to left. To begin with, a very big Irish welcome to President Tarja Hallinen, former President of Finland, 2000 to 2012, who now works closely with the United Nations and is currently a member of the UN Secretary General's High Level Advisory Board on Mediation, a UN Convention to Combat Desertification Drylands Ambassador, and a member of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty of Eminent Persons. To her right, welcome. And next in line, Professor Emerita Monica McWilliams from Ulster University, who co-founded the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition, a political party involved in the multi-party peace negotiations leading to the 1998 peace agreement. She was also elected a member of the Royal Irish Academy two weeks ago, so congratulations on that also, Monica. <laughs> next to her right then is Baroness Ruth Davidson, who is a writer, broadcaster, and politician. A former leader of the Scottish Conservatives, when first elected, Ruth was both the youngest and first openly LGBT leader of a major UK political party. Welcome, Ruth, to Dublin. <laughs> and finally, and by no means least, Professor Yvonne Galligan, who is the Director of Equality, Diversity, and Inclusion, and also Professor of Comparative Politics in Technological University, Dublin. Welcome, Yvonne. We're very fortunate this evening that this discussion will be moderated by RTE broadcaster Anya Lawler. Anya, without any further ado, I'll pass over to you. Thank you. And very best luck. And I just want to say thank you because it really is such a privilege to be on a panel with such, such fantastic women talking about this very pressing topic. And just a note before we start. Um, here in the Academy, which is a fabulous place to be, and I always pinch myself a little whenever I'm in this building, it's beautiful. But the Women on Walls project, which the Academy has been so associated with in promoting and developing here in the building as well, um, it really is making a difference. And I've just come from Leinster House, where again, there's a Women on Walls project. And it's amazing, as a woman who's walked in and out of Leinster House now for 10 years, and you know, walking around with all those men looking down on you for so long, it was pretty oppressive and it's amazing. It's like feeling the spring weather out there today. Now that you can see women's faces back on the walls and Monica, I was looking at a picture of Monica there because there's a brilliant exhibition on about the women who built the peace. And I think it's a really important thing as well, going into the anniversary of Good Friday to remember. And Breed Rogers made this point when we spoke recently as well that right from the get-go, the civil rights movement, it was women who were advocating for peace and what became a peace settlement in Northern Ireland and made such a huge difference. So that's just something I think uh, we ought to mark here today. Um, but having said that, uh, let's start with this question that we are all here 
to discuss and why are there so few women political leaders? And let's start with the former Prime Minister here, the first woman in your country to hold that job. Why, in your opinion, Tariyad Hallinan, are there so few women political so, leaders? So, um, as a matter of fact, we have had some Prime Ministers who are women, but just now we have a Prime Minister and we have um, five, <coughs> five uh, uh, party coalition government in Finland and all, all the leaders of these uh, five political parties are women. Uh, one of them is, is, is pretty young in my eyes, but the, all, all the others are even much younger. And, and the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Sanna Marini is, uh, is uh, 34 years old, which means that it would be young also when, if, it, if he, she would be a man. So, um, I think that uh, uh, women, uh, women are in somehow, they have a self-control or self-critics, which is pretty high. And, and very easily when you ask somebody to come, they say that, oh me, uh, do you think really that I could be good enough? Uh, normally boys or men, when you ask them, they are quite pretty sure that they are good enough. And that's, that's one thing. Somehow we, we um, still raise the girls in different way, already in the families and then later on with, the, with kindergartners and schools and so on. Uh, they are too modest in that way. And the second thing is that, of course, they have a lot, lot to do. Um, still today, for instance, in Nordic countries, we count that um, women have, they work, of course, they study, they do everything well, but they, have, they are also doing more work in their families than they meant. Because we think Nordic countries are a model of social progress uh, and equality. Come closer, they are not paradise. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's always comparative in, in a way that, um, uh, of course we have now the member of the female members of parliament is 47 without quota, so that they are come. But, um, but I know that in some African countries they have now even bigger, bigger numbers already. I mean that the history from 1906 when we started is much, much longer than what they happen to do now in, in uh, new democracies. Uh, of course, they might have then also the quota. But um, what I think is, is as important to say that uh, whether women continue as long as men. I mean, that they think that that's that and then they leave it. Yeah. But uh, some women do, some cannot get up, like <laughs> myself, but, but, uh, but normally women make it a little bit shorter. And then the third point what I want to take here is that uh, in all democracies, and, and not so democracies also, also, you need money, you need money. And women, if you count that what's the budget for the elections, it's, uh, it's always smaller. It's generally taken, it's much so smaller than what, what men have. So somehow I would ask in that way, why the different groups don't support women as much financially than they do for the male candidates? Okay, I don't try to give on lecture, so you continue, please. <laughs> And Monica, particularly, I mean, you're co-founder of the Women's Coalition, and we know the, the critical role that played in Northern Ireland. You're also now doing work in Africa. So, I mean, right across the board, why, why do you think now there are so few women political leaders? Well, I tried to sum it up um, with four Cs. Culture, cash, and confidence, and childcare. Um, and if you start with the culture, and there is a connection. I just got back from South Sudan. I was there for International Women's Day with concern for a week. Um, and I saw something very similar there. Um, very male dominated. It's a new nation. And it's, they're at a risk of going back into a conflict. And it's the women on the ground who are building the peace and trying to keep the peace and sustain the peace over issues like livelihoods and um, putting food on the table. Relatively speaking, we were much better in Northern Ireland in terms of having food on the table, but we still had an issue in relation to women's place. And the Irish constitution, of course, had the role of women in the home. So the role of women in public decision-making and in political life was something different. That's why 
there's a clause in the Good Friday Agreement that we put there which says the right of women to full and equal political participation. Now in Northern Ireland, it was a very patriarchal society, quite conservative, conservative not in the conservative party sense, conservative in the sense of both an armed patriarchy and in some ways an ecumenical patriarchy that really made us emphasize that we shouldn't be in public life. Um, and that's how we got that clause into the agreement because you have to justify Everything that goes into a peace agreement has to have a rationale. And it was the British official who asked us, well, why would you need such a clause? And we said, well, not only have we experienced 30 years of conflict, um, and it was women who were doing a lot of the peace building at the interfaces and across the peace walls, but also we said that conflict kept women out. I mean, my, I myself had to think the night before, um, and we put the Women's Coalition up for election, um, do I really want to be in this place? Um, because of the culture, it was quite sexist and misogynist, as I later discovered when I did get elected. But it was also for safety. We do think about whether we're going to get our, our private lives investigated. And that's another cultural thing. Um, and that's you know, much worse than just what you're wearing, what you're saying. And we get that's another cultural piece about all the time having to be on top of it, your public life being investigated. Do women want that? And so you have to build confidence, which is the second C. Though I do say it's systemic, it's not, I've spent my life building confidence amongst individual women, raising awareness and assertiveness. And you still think, what more needs to be done within the system? And as you say, President, that it's about cash. I was told I'll never give a penny to a political party in my life and I'm not going to start now. Well, that goes for all <laughs> political parties. But when women are running, it's even harder. And I mean this in the best possible sense. Where I got my money was from rich dead women or dead rich women. And I said I didn't care which order they came in <laughs> um, because we were so desperate. Um, and it wasn't possible to just go out like an ordinary party and raise that. So I went to the United States and went to the women's studies programs um, and they knew the importance because they were, it was a new program about having women in public life. And then, of course, I don't need to say much more about childcare. Because when we have children, we have to seriously think who's going to take over in the home. And you can talk some more about this because as the mother of a uh, four-year-old, um, you know exactly the impact that has on your domestic life, your political life, every aspect of your life. And we do think much more about it, and in our meetings, Anya, we had to have childcare at every single one of those meetings. Now I, 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 I support you very strongly. That's one thing which is much, much better in Nordic countries than what it is here or in UK. Yeah, yeah. totally. That's and that's why the Nordic countries um, are so much more ahead of us. And that's a systemic issue. It's not an individual issue. And the leave, the paternity leave, the childcare, and starting at a very early age. And for years, the Irish constitution had the, you know, the notion the best interest of the child was um, in the home with the mother. And it's gonna take us generations to think that it's actually one of the best things for a child is to see um, his or her mother um, as an independent person capable of making their own decisions, not a subordinate subject. Um, so for all of those reasons, I think it is very hard, much harder, but we have done it. And we need role models now to show how we can get through the door, keep the door open, and pass the baton on for others to follow. And we have done it, and we are doing it, but why isn't it happening more and faster? I mean, in terms of your own life experience, Ruth Davidson. Yeah, well, I, I take everything that the previous two speakers have said uh, and, and agree with all of it. And uh, things that I pick out from there is, is your point about um, childcare. There is absolutely the philosophical point that you make about who should be in charge, who does most of that. But there's also the practical point. How do you get elected? You go out by knocking doors and posting leaflets and evenings and weekends. Well, who's got time for that? If you've got to bath the baby, put it to bed, you know, <laughs> take them to football on a Saturday, you know, all of these other things. So there's, there's all the kind of practical implications of that. But there's also um, the confidence issue. It, it's not just about that old, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, advert, Thing that, that used to be in the States, the very sort of 
famous experiment, which was saying that you should have 10 qualities before you apply for a job, and the average woman would have eight of them and think she shouldn't apply, and the average man would have six and think he'd got a great chance of getting it. You know, it, it's not just about the confidence to put yourself forward, although it is quite a thing to put your name on a ballot paper and ask people to vote for you. It's also the confidence of what is that going to change in my life? How am I going to be affected? And, and the point that, that you made, President, about having a, a young female president of Finland at the moment, um, look at the scrutiny that she's been under, that you do not get for male presidents in their 30s and 40s, when she went on an overseas trip to New Zealand uh, and did a joint press conference. Uh, and they were, she and Jacinda Ardern had to answer the question of, you must get on because you're about ages and you're both women. Well, actually, we're here because we're making a trade agreement and there's all of these areas of policy interface that we can talk about. We weren't just talking about bathing babies and washing dishes, thanks very much. Uh, uh, and there's also the confidence about the attacks that you get. Again, you know, as, as, a, as a great example, um, video footage of your president at a house party in a private residence went around the world because she was doing things that other people in their 30s do, drinking and dancing, mm. big whoop. Um, in, in my own experience, I don't think I've ever had a worse day than having to tell my wife that I just had a very senior policeman on the phone, very senior police inspector, that they picked up a credible threat of violence based on our home uh, after a, a council member of mine had been firebombed out of their house a few days before, and that they were going to be posting officers outside their front door, and I had a one-year-old child in the house. I mean, nobody feels that they need to have that. Um, the public sphere of social media as well. Um, Amnesty International did a very famous study five or six years ago now uh, about the amount of abuse that people in public life get uh, on a gendered basis, and found it was so much worse for women than men. The, person that gets the absolute most abuse, in, for example, in the UK House of Commons, is Diane Abbott from the Labour Party. But there's intersectionality there as well, because she's black, because she's a woman, because she's outspoken. Uh, in, my own, you know, in, in my own experience, a lot of the abuse that I've suffered is because I'm also gay and woman, and fat, actually. There's a lot of fat shaming that goes on, but, uh, but interest, which was really interesting. But, um, and because I'm, I'm of the right, it takes a different hue to what Diana Gabbett gets because she's of the left. And there is an element of, do you want to put your family through that? And I think that there is an onus, onus not just on, on women, but everybody who's involved in elected politics, to be the support for each other and not to be the dog whistle that helps the pylons in that sort of a way, whether you're male or female, because the health of a democracy relies on people from all backgrounds coming forward. It relies on people across your country being able to see people like them. Uh, and while I, I'm always very clear with people that say that they're interested in getting into politics, about making sure they do it with their eyes open, I still say to them, even with phone calls like that one that I had, even with 10 years of you know, having to let partners down and the, the attrition that comes with the, the life of being a politician and never switching off and always having to be on call and you know, taking a step out of a family wedding or letting down a, a friend at a birthday party because something's come up, I, I would say that you should still do it because it matters. Politics matters. Even if people don't particularly like the government of the day or the way in which political decisions are made, these are decisions mm -hmm. in representative democracies that are about one of us and a number of us going to a place to make decisions for all of us. And there's nothing that is more important than that. And I want to come back to that business of social media, and it, mm. it, if you like the way this is all being kind of dressed up. It's a, so it's a question of, uh, is this kind of increasing culture war because we're making progress and women are increasingly visible or what's going on? Because I hear politicians talking about this nonstop. But Yvonne, let's talk about the couple of issues that, are, that have come up in terms of leadership and in terms of you know, getting more women leaders. The evidence on networking, on quotas, and again, I, you're the expert here. Um, how is that working? How does that need to work more? Well, um, it, it certainly is working. Um, um, but uh, before I begin to speak about that, I'd just like to pick up on some of the comments yeah. that, uh, that have been uh, already uh, mentioned. Um, and I think um, there is one point, which is public discourse, um, which uh, Ruth has been speaking about, and Monica as well. 
And in a way, um, it requires those people who are supportive of seeing more women in politics to actually be more vocal in the public arena in saying that and coming out and, that, and supporting women who are in the public arena, irrespective of whatever their uh, political affiliation happens to be. The notion of supporting more women is, is really very important, which comes also back to the culture and cultural attitudes. If we um, don't say that we want more women to be in politics, wh what are we saying? Are we saying we don't want women in that space? And in a way, your um, description about the women on walls and the importance of seeing the women on walls is in fact a reflection of how important it is to visually and verbally uh, acknowledge the importance of the contribution women make to political and to public life. So these issues really are important. Um, as our parties, and I'd like to add another C to Monica's C, which is candidate selection. Parties have a very strong role to play in this as well, in terms of looking for, um, uh, nurturing, supporting, and then putting women forward as candidates. Because part of the reason we have so few women in politics is because they're not on the ballot paper to be voted on in the first place. The other thing, and just to interject for a second, but, but it's interesting because I've had po women politicians raise this with me. And so again, the parties will put enough women on the ballot paper. In our PR system, you have a number of candidates. So they'll be running you know, the three or four candidates and you know, the women will be there. But the candidate who's getting the most money, the candidate who's at getting the most posters, the candidate who's getting the party's backing is the man. And, you, you know, so that women are, there, a lot of women candidates feel they're being used as kind of tokens to meet a quota. And I can understand that because um, the quota is not long implemented in our political system. At the moment, it's 30%. Uh, of uh, candidates from political parties must be female, 30% must be male, and then uh, it can go beyond that, but 30% is a floor, and it's going to rise to 40% at the next election. <coughs> um, uh, and there is a sense among, uh, among women that they're just being used to fill a slot. But in a way, we have to allow the electoral system and parties and the political system to get used to running more women, to get used to having women elected, to, uh, to get used to having a critical mass of women in the political sphere. We're not there yet in Ireland mm -hmm. because we only have, we have less than one quarter of, of our TDs are women. The UK is doing better. Uh, in that over one third of MPs are women, and of course the Netherlands, uh, the, the uh, Finland is a way ahead, um, and it just takes time, and that's been proven by research. It takes three or four electoral cycles for everybody to begin to feel comfortable mm -hmm. with this intervention that is there to crack what has been a very <laughs> patriarchal, very male-dominated institution and culture yeah. for the last 100 years. So let's talk about what works in terms of getting women in politics and in terms of leadership. You're a great believer, aren't you, President Hallinan? Yeah, I... I <coughs> sorry. I hate your copies. They, <laughs> <coughs> they cause an allergic reaction. Anyway, so... Um, uh, International Parliamentary Union has researched quite much that how much the election system will have also influence that how many men or women or different kind of the persons will be elected, what is the variety. And, and so this uh, quota system, of course, can be a different way. If you have the system where you uh, vote the list, and so in the it's so the political party is in, in the very, very strong key position. And then, for instance, in Sweden, they did the system that you have to have a man, woman, man, woman, or woman, man, woman, man. So that uh, if you take, for instance, five first ones, so, so you will automatically get the men and women. In Finland, we have the system that political parties put their candidates in the same list. And the amount of the votes what the party will get 
uh, it tells how many seats you will get in the parliament. Uh, of course, we have the different elections areas. But then people vote a person. So you can, you can, you can pick up the person you like. Now, I think Sweden has also changed their system to this direction that you can also cross the person who is much more below in the list than, than what the party has put. But um, personally, I said that that has been a good idea that we, we can vote a person, not the list. But uh, of course, this gives again better possibilities for those who get somehow publicity, for instance, they are journalists, and they might be the film stars, or they might be something else who are already in the publicity. Or they have money, they have money enough. So in, in that way, I think that we should always see the entities as how you, how you put it in, in the way. But the second point, which is quite interesting, is that if you have an election and you elect the members of the city council or the parliament, so you get a certain number of women and men, but then if you see the next step, that those who have been elected will then elect something for the different boards or for the governments and so on, then it seems to be so that uh, the male domination normally continues. Mm -hmm. uh, one way what we noticed have been done, how could I say, helping the situation, that if you are in the position to be a chairperson of your political party. Some of you have been. So, so this is the way to get also the good nomination because they are normally prime ministers uh, and the others, they are, they are the uh, chairpersons of their own political parties. But then again, if you come to the presidents, what I have been. So the presidents in Finland and France, we have the similar system. So you vote again directly a person. And in Finland, all the political parties, they are, they are not big enough to, to do it by their own. They have to make a coalition, which normally means that you have the first, first uh, voting, the first tracation, and then you have the second one where the two best ones will go. And very often with the next, next step, uh, you have to vote the persons you hate less because not always your whole candidate will be the second round. Mm -hmm. And that makes again the speculation and the tactics how to, how, how to take it. And uh, sometimes the persons who not, even if it's not just love, but who are not disliked. So mm -hmm. this, is, this is the good way. And, and what we see now in uh, social media, what you will take later on, so, um, the feelings concerning the women are stronger uh, by men or by, by women. So that if they love, they do love. If they hate, they do hate. And, and for instance, in, in uh, social media, uh, the dirtiest messages uh, the persons get, they, they, the women are getting those, mm -hmm. those yeah. not the men. I mean, of course, they don't they don't treat men with the softly, but I mean that if they really want to be good, it's uh, it's the. And Monica, the woman. I mean, you had experience of that in a society which was yeah, a, yeah, a yeah. very violent and yeah, very, very dangerous. Yeah, and, and so even afterwards, I stopped being the president of the Republic already in 2012 when I have served the full two six years period. But now, <laughs> the, the war in uh, when the Russia started the, uh, this. Uh, boy in Ukraine, so, so the, of course, we who are in my generation who try to build a new Europe, uh, either in Germany or here yeah. or in, in, in many other countries, so we were accused that you, are, you have been naive. I, I always say that uh, anyway, peace building is, is never to be too naive, but um, you should uh, see those who have broken this, uh, this bee that we can make a new Europe. So uh, we have got a terrible, terrible message. So, I mean that, uh, so it's good and bad. Uh, and, and now I will stop when I will say that when Angela Merkel started her political career, so Cole, who who's uh, some kind of favorite she was, um, if you are the first one, you have to have also the male supporters. So Helmut Kohl uh, called her always das Mädchen, the girl. But then when Angela became 
chancellor and, and was a very, very popular and dominating the whole German politics. Uh, so she got the nickname Mutti, which is a mother. So all the time she was a woman. Yeah. Median or Mutti, but woman anyway. Hmm. Okay, that's and there it. were a lot of people calling the Women Coalition Matians all right, weren't there? <laughs> I'll come to that in a, in a, a moment. Uh, those were the nice things we were called. <laughs> Mother or girl would have been lovely. Um, but the, I think this is a really important point, and there's a science to it, which is electoral systems. And we tried to promote the system that Scotland has, you may not know this, um, the nights before Good Friday. Yeah. And it's interesting that the men wanted to go back to what they knew best, the status quo. The women wanted something different because they could see that the more diversity you have after a conflict and when you're transitioning from a conflict, the better for politics rather than the same old, same old. Um, and we tried all night to get the system, the list system, and a constituency-based system. Now, this may sound complicated, but it was the list system that brought a party like mine into the talks. There was no intention of having new civil society actors. In every transition, in every peace negotiations, there tends to be the old constitutional parties, and rightly so, who've tried to negotiate before and many times failed, as they did in our case, and the armed groups. That's who gets to the table, and predominantly, if not all, men. When the British government sat down to design the system for our peace talks, they needed those armed groups. So they designed a new system. It was called the list system. It was the parties, the first 10 parties across the line would get elected. And it was us, the women, that sat down and said, we bet there'll be no women at that table amongst those parties. And we wrote to them and they didn't have the courtesy to reply, so we rolled up our sleeves and did it ourselves. And when I got into that room on that very first day, we were the only two women at the table. So there would have been no women at the table, but what was good about that system, it was called the list system, it was 10 parties, meant that we were a team. We weren't individual women standing, which was a very dangerous time. Of course, there had been ceasefires, but we were still nervous. If you go to a peace table, you mightn't survive. You could have assassinations of those that are negotiating. So, of course, getting in there was a huge success, and we wanted that system to continue. And it was to a huge disappointment of ours on Good Friday that we were asked to withdraw that proposal, to take it off the table. And now, to this day, we kind of regret it. Instead, we, we allowed the other proposal that we had as we were coming down the very end um, of the Civic Forum, which was another way, like your citizens' assemblies here in the Republic, which have only come in recently, we figured, okay, let's have more diversity and pluralism in our system, advising on social, economic, and cultural issues. We did succeed in getting that into the Good Friday Agreement, and it has never been stood up. Mm -hmm. All, only for two weeks, and in 25 years, we've never had it. So there's two ideas that came from a women's coalition, imaginative, creative, different way of doing politics, making politics work. And what I would say now, if I had to go back to the table, and when Senator Mitchell said each party at the table was allowed to put something into the peace agreement that belonged only to that party, in other words, your stamp, we should have stuck to our new electoral system. And that would have included some of those, one of the parties was affiliated to an armed group on the loyalist side, and they were sent back out to the cold because we knew that they wouldn't get elected in this constituency-based system. And that was a disaster. And to this day, I'm now a member of the Independent Reporting Commission to disband paramilitaries. And that's the group that I'm working hardest at to finally, after 25 years, transition. And so there's loads of lessons there, Anya, for conflict resolution, for designing a new political system. And look what you've just heard. Sweden and Finland changing. Changing because of what? Because they could see the reason and the rationale to do something different. And it's working. And when we put this forward, we were told, Ah, you girls, you really are bothering us. You know, there's bigger issues tonight. Just forget that, leave it. Um, we'll be fine. Political wool, in the end, will work. Now, guess what? We got a quota later for the police. 50% of Catholics. Every new recruit, 50% had to be Catholics. Did 50% have to be women? There were as few women in the old police force 
the day of priest service as there were um, Catholics, but there was no quota. So it's interesting, political will, political will will work for religion. Sometimes it works for political identity, as it did in our case, but it's taken us probably now 25 years to recognize it also needs to be there for gender recognition. And that was one of the great what if missed moments, I think, uh, in in uh, the, the development of politics in Northern Ireland. That and so so we we're, we're hearing and seeing the huge difference that you know systems and you know changing systems, bringing in quotas and so on. Also interesting when you start looking at something like the citizens assembly model, or you know what we can see in Scandinavia, or what we saw around the time that the Good Friday Agreement was being brought together. When you put together a balanced group of people. It's amazing the more balanced policies that tend to come out the other end, as we've seen in action here. Yes, indeed we have, and uh, the Citizens' Assembly on Gender Equality, um, and indeed the Citizens' Assemblies on other issues as well, for example, the Eighth Amendment and, and many other issues, um, have given an opportunity for Irish citizens to dwell deeply on, on very difficult, very um, complex issues. And uh, having had the privilege of being involved in a couple of those citizens' assemblies, um, I really think that when people are conf are really get the time and the space to think through uh, these issues, that uh, people take very considered positions. And that makes it then very difficult to, um, to come along and to say that these positions are not legitimate ones to hold because I have seen how that process works mm. and it is a good process. And subsequently in terms of uh, the uh, uh, Citizens' Assembly on Gender Equality, we will now have um, a referendum in November on removing uh, the, the special status of women in the home to a more general um, uh, provision on uh, the role of care and everybody's responsibility to care. And that to me seems to be a much more uh, equitable and also a, a, a a, a position that everybody can agree yeah. with. But also, <clears throat> you know, we're all here and agreeing on all of that, but Ruth Davidson, I know, I, I don't know much about Scottish politics, but I do know, <laughs> it's, it's a pretty tough and partisan game. And, you know, you, you, no shrinking violet, put it that way, would, you know, it's not recommended for shrinking violets. So all of that, you know, consensus building and citizens' voices, how does that square with women leading, and, and most of us work in partisan policies where it's one side pitted against the other. Yeah, so when the Scottish Parliament was designed, uh, so the, the devolution referendum for Scotland, uh, Wales and, and Northern Ireland was in 1997. Uh, our Parliament was up and running by 1999. The thought that went into things like the electoral system, the additional member system, where we have 129 seats in the Scottish Parliament, 73 are elected first past the post, the other 56 are elected through regional lists, uh, which is how smaller parties get in. Um, a lot of thought was given to that. A lot of thought was given to the fact that we wanted a semicircular chamber like European parliaments. We did not want to have an adversarial chamber like the House of Commons with your two sword lengths uh, across the dispatch box uh, because we wanted to do politics differently. Um, the idea that Scottish politics is in any way more consensual uh, than UK politics is, I'm afraid, for the birds. And I've um, been in the lucky position where all of the main parties at one point when I was leader uh, were led by women and our presiding officer was a woman at the time. We had a very female-facing parliament. Um, I've also been in the position where, um, you know, that's not been the case. There's been majority male political leaders in there. I, I honestly, in terms of how red and teeth and claw the debate has been, I haven't seen much difference about that. But, but I think, to come back to the point that, that Monica just, made... Just oh, sorry. Before you, so, you know when people talk about networking, and I'll be coming back to you in a moment on, on that, President Harriman. You, you know, what comes first? Your political affiliation 
or your does that, does that get in the way of women being able to network across parties? That's really because we hear a lot of talk about you know, women's caucuses, women's networks. So how does that square with that? Yeah, so I mean, in terms of how, in my experience, how we did it in uh, the Scottish Parliament, there wasn't a separate women's group particularly, uh, but there were when issues came up or topics came up or debates came up. Um, there is certainly a lot of solidarity amongst the women and the way in which um, alliances are made cross-party. Um, a lot of it's about who you came in with, so you get to know the people that came in in the same electoral intake as you, and then who you sit on committees with, which is where a lot of the bipartisan or, or cross-party working happens, and you become friends uh, with people that way, uh, and you know who to speak to if you want to get a bill co-signed or something like that, you want, want support. And that's kind of how it happens elsewhere. In terms of, since I arrived in the House of Lords 18 months ago, um, there is a, a you know a, a conservative women's WhatsApp group um, for for members, um, but it's along party lines and gender lines. You know, but, but we do talk about different things with our, our, our male colleagues, and, and we are very much in the minority I there. Think it's a bit different to some of the male Tory oh, MPs. I, yeah, I, I've, not, I've never been in the House of Commons, so I, I you know I, I can speak having dealt with lots of, of MPs. I've never sat in it, um, but the House of Lords is incredibly genteel in comparison with Holyrood. Let me say that. Um, there is. One thing I, I would quite like to say in terms of the UK and different ways in which you can select and support women to get them into Parliament, we've never found an optimum and almost every party does it differently. So currently the UK Labour Party has a pairing system where they have two seats and that are next door to each other and their uh, associations have to pick a woman and a man. They don't say which way round it has to be. They also have some seats that are reserved uh, for all women shortlists. In Scottish Labour, they have a zipping system on the list. So if your list is headed by a man, the next person on it has to be a woman, even if when it was voted for, she would have come fourth or fifth. Um, and if it was a woman that comes top, then it's a man. So the top two are always uh, gender balanced. Uh, in terms of the Scottish Conservatives, we do an endorsement system where there is a panel that puts forward we think that you should endorse to be at the top of your list. And we make sure that that has uh, gender uh, recognition as well as um, minority ethnic recognition. The SNP are very interesting. They trialled at the election in 2021 um, with their list system, uh, reserving spaces for people who self-identified with a disability, which is quite interesting, I thought. Um, but they didn't define what that was and got into quite a lot of issues where people that were already members that thought they might drop down the list suddenly declared to be dyslexic or diabetic and it caused quite a lot of rancor so I think they're going to look at how they do that uh, which is a, a different way of doing it but the one thing that I want to talk about but women coming in and I'll be really quick I know I've talked a lot but um, there's a really interesting study and I would, I'd urge people to go and look it up that was done in Canada which is about why when you have political parties that have women in them that have legislatures that have women in them why women are often considered when a party gets in the shit to be the right people to be an interim leader while you get out the shit but will not be elected a, the, the next long-term leader. And um, they've got a really interesting thing about that. And, and I think it's really interesting in the UK that with 100 years, over 100 years, of women having the vote, some women having the vote, mm -hmm. um, yes, you've had three Conservative leaders, um, you've had one Lib Dem female leader, you've had one SNP female leader, and no female Labour leaders in over 100 years of female representation in there. So yes, getting people into Parliament is important, but how you get, get, then get them into a leadership position, there's still a barrier once you get them there. So what do we do about that? Although the only thing I, it's, and I, I, I want to come yeah. to you on, on the networking thing, at the moment, uh, we've, Sinn Féin is led by, by a woman. I, w I would say she doesn't see herself as an interim leader in any way, shape or form. <laughs> uh, the Labour Party is led by a woman. Social Democrats led by a woman just taken o over from two co-leaders. So even while actually the, rep and the representation of women in Cabinet, some people argue, falls short. But, but in those respects, and, and they are, none of them, I would argue, seen as in any so, so, I mean, way. Interim, yeah, so, but, so it's interesting and compared that. Out. Yeah. They needed somebody to be the interim leader of the Labour Party, which was Patricia Hewitt, before Tony Blair and Gordon Brown faced off and then did a deal and Tony Blair became leader. So I'm, I'm talking like genuine interim holding the yeah. fort until you elect a new leader. The, I, I thought the Canadian study was really interesting. Yeah. 
Uh, so we know that decisions about electoral systems and changing electoral systems, however it's done through quotas or lists, that these, these are critical. J just th this business of, of politicians, women politicians networking across party lines, how critical is that, your experience of that? Because we were talking about this beforehand. Yeah, so we have discussed about that earlier because <coughs> when we, uh, the Finnish women got the right to vote and also candidate in the elections in 1906. And already in the first parliamentary elections, they got almost 20, 20 members out of 200. And um, they, they get more and more women, which I, I could say that uh, that was important for the so-called welfare society, because when you had a certain amount, even the minority women, so they, they took this, these things to agenda because they were considered to be the women's issue. And now the situation in that way is better than in Nordic countries also the men want to have a role in the family, something more than money earners. And, and then uh, perhaps in the future it's not the same that uh, uh, it's just the we women who have to try to, to get the, the daycare or the any kind of the child allowance is, uh, through the parliament. But, um, but it has been historically so. And, and then it was in 1970, in the 1980s, when we finally then thought that even we have a very long tradition, we need a more cooperation. And then we created this women's network in the parliament. And uh, as I said, it's important, of course, to get a uh, female MPs to work together for a certain issue, but it's also important to know why they don't want to do that. I mean that if you discuss a uh, more friendly or cool way with your female, female uh, colleague in the parliament, that why you think that the um, daycare is, is not so necessary, so why you do? And then it might be so that it might be the culture, but it might be also so that, that you know that uh, I come from the farmer's family and, and we cannot create in, in the country, which is a large area and only 5.5 million people, you cannot give this kind of the, the services that we think more that it could be this or that. So, and, and then we finally found, I remember uh, in uh, the compromise would solve this uh, daycare system so that uh, that all the families have this subjective <coughs> right to, to have a place for their children if they want or they get money, either or. And, and so uh, there were two female politicians, one, one, one from the centre party, uh, from the supporting the countryside opinion, and another one from the social <coughs> democrats who saw it more for like an urban areas. And, and so, so we, we made a compromise that the family will choose whether it's money or whether it, it's a uh, municipal daycare place which has a certain quality. Now, of course, we noticed then later on that uh, the problem was that the poorest families or the immigrant families, they choose very often the money and not the daycare place. And, and, and so uh, their children, were not as prepared, trained for the school when they started school than those who have been in the good daycare place um, by the municipality where <coughs> they have learned how to, how to be in the room, how to do the teamwork, to get some, some basic, basic areas. And now we have made another reform. It has been already quite many years in Finland that before you start school, the child has to be in preschool education. And uh, it means that when we, we, we start very late, the, uh, the school duty starts in Finland when the child is seven years old, which is much higher than, for instance, in the UK. But uh, when you are six, or in many municipalities now, five years old, so you get the preschool education. And this is for everyone. And I mean that, uh, now the money has not that role, but uh, so the children will be more integrated. 
And it seemed to be very important, especially for the immigrant children, those who as a refugee or have otherwise moved the families, because they learn then to speak Finnish and they learn the terminology there. And, and so, uh, how could I say that then even so-called better families notice that their children need also this preschool education, the day, day care much earlier already. And uh, then, then I think that uh, we start thinking more daycare system like what is the best for a child okay. and in which way you do that. And I think that women has a very big role of that. But it has been also in many other issues. So I think it has been, I was 20 years in the parliament. I think that I consider that it was very useful to learn to know smart ladies from the different political parties. Okay. Even we couldn't agree in everything. The other issue, and I'll be bringing in questions from the floor, floor in just a minute, but there's two, two other points I want to touch on. Uh, briefly with the panel before, and maybe you, Ruth, you talk about this because we have seen, and, and it's funny because it's being spoken of admiringly, the, the women leaders who choose to walk away. Mm. Yourself, Nicola Sturgeon, um, Jacinta Ardern, and the politics, the, the women are more likely actually to go yes to leadership, yes to politics, but also yes to the rest of my life. I think, again, if you look at um, Angela Merkel, who's been mentioned before as well in, in that sense, um, I mean, I, I think in my own position, and I think in Jacinda Ardern's as well, there was an element of professional pride about it. Um, quite a lot had changed. Um, there was an element to which there was going, for me, it was very clear after the Prime Minister changed and the gridlock that was in the UK Parliament um, when Theresa May uh, left and Boris Johnson came in that um, there was going to have to be a snap election um, in order to break the impasse. Um, I'm good at elections, that's a bit of politics that I'm best at. I've had some you know, great results. Uh, I love campaigns, um, but they are completely all-consuming. It is being on the road for six weeks. It is up to 100 hours a week, you know, um, and the heat of battle is amazing and there's no drug like it, it's phenomenal. Um, but I also had an eight month baby in the house. Uh, I also, you know, um, with the change of prime minister, found myself outside of rooms that I had previously been inside because of my relationship with the new prime minister compared to my relationship with Theresa May and before that, David Cameron. Um, and there's an element to which the fact that it was clearly going to be a Brexit-based referendum on which the Conservative Party was going to be on the side of Brexit and getting it done, or whatever the words were going to be at the time. The phrase hadn't been invented by that point. Uh, and I had been a huge campaigner, you know, standing on the Wembley stage, shouting at Boris Johnson about how he needed to tell people the truth, uh, because I was a Remainer and continued to be. I was not the person that could lead our party in that. So for me, um, it was very obvious why I had to stand down because I could not fulfill the job to the level that I had previously done it. And the question you ask yourself is, are you willing to do it to a less effective standard or do you walk? Um, and for me, I had to walk. And they're more likely to stay though, aren't they? Or that's what I we have I seen. Don't, I don't they? know. I mean, I think in, in terms of Jacinda Ardern, um, she c was clearly going to have another election. The polls were, were not great. She was also in a different position than when she had come you know, from third to being able to become uh, prime minister, uh, even though she had slightly fewer votes and seats. But, but then she'd already had another interim election, so she'd, she'd planted her flag. She'd got her, you know, her, her, the biggest party status. Um, she was in a position where a lot was changing. And, and from the subtext of what she was saying, there was a lot that struck me about the fact that she could have done. She's probably the best person to lead her party into that election. But would she have led it as well as she'd done in the previous two? And you know, people that go into politics have ambition. We shouldn't, as women, we should not be ashamed to say we're ambitious and that we want good results and we want to be effective at what we do. And um, and and even if, let me just say as a coda, even if you do walk away at a time of your own choosing and, and the papers don't get that picture of you crying in the back of the car after an election that they love to have or you looking crumpled, um, you don't get forgiven for walking away. There will always be a cohort of people that think that you have somehow cheated them. And it's not just your opponents. There are people within your own organization who think that um, 
you've left them in the lurch. It's the only job in the world where you're not allowed to change job. It's the only career in the world where the rancor that you often establish from people who've been some of your biggest supporters that feel like you've let them down because you didn't flog yourself to the end into, you know, in, into the ground. It's, it's a very, very odd thing. Well, I didn't expect that. That's why I think you do need to have things called support networks. Um, there are things happening now 25 years after the agreement was signed that couldn't have happened 25 years ago. Last week in Washington, I put together a panel of women who had come forward, stood up and to be counted. Um, and they couldn't even have stood in a photograph together 25 years ago, but now they can. And 25 years ago, when I went into the first assembly, I tried to form a women's caucus, but the parties on the divide who hadn't been pro-agreement wouldn't allow their women to join that caucus. Um, they first came in as enemies, then opponents, and today they're colleagues. But we built that, and there is a women's support network, there is a women's caucus, and I don't think the women's coalition would have ever succeeded um, if we had been hard on each other um, at times when we made mistakes. I said, listen, I may be one of the co-founders, co-leaders, but I'm bound to make mistakes because we're a coalition coming from completely different backgrounds by the dint of the nature of the title coalition from different religious backgrounds, political identity backgrounds, um, rural urban, different income backgrounds. So you were bound to make mistakes. And I said, don't hang anybody out for that because the press will love it. And once again, we'll say there's the women at each other's throats. Stick together. And the, I think it's a Chinese proverb. You can go faster alone, but you go further together. Yeah. And that's the point in politics, I think, that sometimes we women have got to form those networks and stick together. And I'm very pleased to say that when I travel around the communities in Northern Ireland, I can see great work being done on a cross-community level through women's support networks. Who wants to come in there? And I think the importance of the Women's Coalition uh, was uh, that, among many other things, it also put uh, the role of women in politics onto the agenda of the other political parties as well because they suddenly had to pay attention to the profile of the people that they were putting forward uh, to be elected for them. And then later on, as Monica says, um, there was, much later on, there was and is uh, a women's caucus in the Northern Ireland Assembly which was set up by a member of Sinn Féin, Katrina Rowan, and a member of the DUP, Paula Bradley. Now, 25 years ago, that would absolutely never, ever have happened. Um, but the fact that it happened yeah. about 15, 20 years, uh, 15 or 10 years ago is, is an important uh, point. But I think also in terms of uh, the very personal story that Ruth told about uh, being a woman leader and stepping back and the reality of that. Um, I think we should also remember that there are more and more women taking on the role of political leaders. So 10 years ago, um, across the European Union, only uh, women comprised 13% of all the political leaders yeah. in the European Union. Today it's 26%, so that's doubled in the space of 10 years. So there are women continually coming forward with the ambition to lead their parties and doing so, and doing so very credibly. And I think that's a, that augurs very, very well for the future. I want, to, um, I want to talk to you about another issue we were talking about beforehand, and that's the issue of young women in politics and, uh, and the new generation in politics. Anyone who wants to put a question to the panel, by the way, if you put up your hand now, we'll get a microphone to you and then I'll come to you after this. We have a couple of microphones around the hall, so if you want to put a question directly to the panel, uh, please feel free, just wave that hand in the air, uh, and we have one there. But what I want to talk about, and we've seen this with... Um, We've seen this with Greta Thunberg, we, we, we've seen this in, in Iran, we, we have seen around the world that movements for change are being led in, to a lot, huge extent by young women. Um, not necessarily within a party political movement, but certainly politically involved and active. So, and, and I mean, you're meeting these young people all the time, day to day. So, so your thoughts on, on, on what that's changed, and their different approach to politics and leadership. 
Uh, yes, I mean, I just have to uh, stand back in awe at the young women uh, that are coming through today as leaders in so many different areas. Um, and they're doing so with confidence and with courage. And, uh, and for them, I think there are a couple of really, really uh, uh, deep issues that they really care about. Obviously, climate change. And within that, climate justice for them <coughs> is very much a touchstone of their, uh, of their activity in the social uh, space and in the public space. And uh, the other is the whole area of equality <coughs> and equity in its widest sense is something that um, young women are really deeply impassioned about. Um, and I think we should be there supporting these young women and supporting the young men that support those young women too. Um, and encouraging them forward. Because what we have found also is that we were just speaking about women leading political parties. When women do lead political parties, those political parties have more references to climate change and climate justice in their manifestos, to environmental issues in their priorities, and to human rights and equality issues on their agendas more so than parties that are led by men. So I think there's something really important happening. And I think there's a generational shift happening in terms of, uh, of the, the policies and the issues yeah. that affect uh, uh, politics today. And while we're seeing some of that progress, and I'd love to hear from some of the rest of the panel on this, on this in some part of the world, and we are seeing within particularly movements like the climate movement, great progress being made. There's also, been a huge switch in, in the States, in China, other parts of the world to kind of macho authoritarianism and in some cases almost a democratic deficit. You look at Afghanistan, you look at the situation of women, girls not being able to go to school. Um, so <coughs> balancing all of that up and, and, and your thoughts on the position for young women both within our countries and then looking around the world, Tarya maybe. Yeah. I would love to be the whole evening, especially when, when we are speaking about Afghanistan, we are speaking about the Northern Ireland, so because, because what we have now studied lately by the UN and many other organizations, ANSET and, and uh, the Swedish Science Institute, and so is that whether uh, involvement of the women in the peace processes could give uh, a more the stronger peace agreements or the long, longer standing uh, peace process because we know that uh, peace processes are very, very time-taking system. And then finally, when we get the peace agreement, so quite a big percentage of them will, uh, will be broken in a few years. And that's why ah, I would have to, to, to research what you have done so more. But, uh, uh, if I take then, I have been after, after leaving the, the press uh, as the president of the Republic, so I think that I, I have done my full, full years, and, and so I have been involved very much in sustainable development by I have this circle. I was a uh, co-chair in the, the Rio process, and, and then the result was this agenda 2030, and then later on in the same year, the Paris climate change. And we noticed already in that time that, of course, both the men and women and the younger generation were very interested in this, uh, these issues. But especially if you think, uh, think uh, the broader networking. So the women are those who are for the, for the uh, ecological uh, sustainability, but also the social justice and for the human rights and democratic issues. So we noticed that that was the basis of the democratic society. Of course, the uh, elections are like a thermometer which, which counts that was the situation in, in different countries. But uh, so basically, uh, basically these uh, rank and file organizations later on also, the, the leaders, they, they are more and more women. And that's why the future doesn't look so bad. I mean that uh, that they are, women are very often, they're very stubborn. 
that if they have decided they do, they do. And, and also you see it in NGOs that they, if they're in politics, they can go away because it's not for their lifelong uh, uh, duty, but in uh, NGOs they are all their life normally. They don't give up. And, and so um, I'm, I have spoken very much for the men also that uh, women are only 50% of the population. We need, of course, the progressive men too so that we can get 100% and save the planet. But, um, but uh, really I think that this is, this is the area we could, be better, could do better. And then, of course, with the uh, digital world and with the data, all these uh, open data systems, so we should also encourage girls to see these technical new things that how they can help us to do things better, more rapidly, more effectively. And, and so, uh, so that's why I'm very happy that now and the same later yeah. I think games are now better there. But I mean that that's, that's it, <laughs> no, that no. don't underestimate the importance of the uh, NGOs. I think that this is, this is really the future because sustainable development doesn't happen only with the parliaments and governments and politicians. It can happen only if, if uh, it's a very broad basis. I, and I there we are. Agree, but I, I do sometimes yeah. worry, particularly in, in sort of our part of the world, that a lot of young people are, um, and I, I like you take my hat off to them, are um, really seduced by the idea of, of being part of these large movements but not in any way interested in being party political and we do still need them to see that you can achieve as much or more being in the room making the decisions being in the parliament having the votes rather than being outside and carrying a banner and we've got to have both and, and you've, you've got to have the pressure on the outside i absolutely agree that you've got to have people that have lived experience that are working there on the ground you've got to have people whose voices can be lifted up um, absolutely 100% agree with that but let's not have that at the expense of telling our young people that there's a place for you in our parliament too. I agree entirely. I think um, p and political actors need to be more respectful towards civil society actors and civil society actors need to understand the difficulties that political actors yeah. face. I have spent all my life working on violence against women uh, and girls and that was a bottom-up movement yeah. and it was an NGO movement. And much of our early legislation and policy came out of that movement, and Scottish legislation is a good example of it, because many of them came from the NGOs, as they call them, and also femocrats, not bureaucrats, femocrats. And they came in and became the parliamentarians, who then changed the legislation. So I see it as a continuum, that you can cut your political teeth in the NGOs, um, but I worry about young people being very cynical about politics. You have to be inside the system also. And if we're going to change that system, it is to bring in new blood, to bring in that energy. I despaired when I saw the army, Arab Spring turn into an Arab winter. And I could see those women leading the Arab Spring. And I figured if they don't get organized politically, some junta is going to take over, which is what happened. They left a gap, they left a space. Um, and I think that's also the case in, in these autocratic countries. The NGOs brilliantly have got organized, but they also need to be inside that system to keep it democratic, so that the big beasts don't suddenly find those vacuums and get in there. And thank you. I think it's really important to talk about that because too often it's you know it's it's easy to just talk about you know the situation for women in Europe and, 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 and the Western world and you know I was it, listen, I was in Afghanistan in twenty eighteen, February twenty eighteen and I met with a number of female MPs that were there who were, we were meeting in the, the UK embassy so they were away from you know any prying eyes it was very private um, and they could see what was coming they could see a backlash coming and we didn't listen we didn't in terms of what we needed to do and what America and others and other actors and agents that were in there needed to lift them out they you know they were the canary in the coal mine and they were telling us and we didn't listen we didn't act there's another example of the UN when um, um, I watched it in Geneva because I've been working with the Syrian women um, and they had a civil society advisory panel and a women's advisory panel sitting alongside their negotiations 
following the United Nations resolution, Women, Peace and Security, which I'm proud to say was built on our experience in Northern Ireland when they saw the difference it could make to have women at the peace table. But what's happening now on, in Geneva, and have still uh, with the, those women negotiators, and they're brilliant negotiators, is this geopolitics that's going on with China and Iran, and it's taken, you know, in Russia, all the negotiations on one side are taking place in Moscow. Can the women get there? Are they there? No. Are they over in the European Union or the Brussels United States negotiations or NATO negotiations? No. They're all seen as high level. Whereas when they were actually doing the negotiations with those uh, parallel advisory committees running alongside them, the grassroots women, the peace builder women, the peace circles that had been built on women through Syria were at the table. So that's another fear I have, is that the, the, these negotiations now are outside of our hands. I think they're really, really, really important points to make and, and thank you for them. We, we have the, the lady there in the lovely glittery jacket. Thanks. Uh, good evening, panel. Thank you very much for a lovely discussion. Can you hear me? You can? Yes. yes. Yeah, great. My name is Marlee Walsh from uh, West Cork, and it's lovely to be here this evening in this beautiful building. Uh, it's my first time. And my query really is, uh, my question is about agency. And how do, in your, your own experience, those of you that were elected and worked in politics, how did you feel in comparison to our male counterparts, your agency was? Hmm. I suppose it, I'm bringing in the tokenism piece yeah. and the scapegoat piece yeah. that, that, that as an onlooker and somebody who was interested in female leadership, you'd be very concerned about that because I suppose when we have younger people looking on and when you're trying to see, to show them that, that women leaders can be successful, you carry a very important um, responsibility then for those younger women as well, not to be used as a scapegoat or to indeed to be set up to <laughs> just be a filler, you mm. know? Because you're, I think it would be detrimental to Ruth's piece about how important it is for women not just to see themselves in NGOs, but also in the political space as well. Thank you. Thank you for that. Who wants to respond to that? Well, you know, I think it's also important not to blame women for being scapegoat. They are going to be scapegoated, and that's when you need champions coming in. Actually, one of your Prime Ministers was one of the champions at our peace talks, Prime Minister Holkery, uh, along with Senator Mitchell and General de Chastain. And I used to say to Prime Minister Holkery, would you stand up for us a little bit more whenever we're getting insulted at the table? Things like, you women, the only table you should be at is the one you're going to polish. And I would say, if, if you were in Finland, would you allow that? And the difficulty with him being in the chair, and I can say this now, 25 years later, and not just because he's deceased, was that they didn't feel that was their role as chairpersons back then. I would like to think they would now in calling it out, that unacceptable scapegoat that was happening to us to make us feel smaller, to make us feel we had less agency, to make us feel we had less rights um, at, at being at that table. The other thing I would say on you, and maybe I didn't answer your question for a good reason, because it's all I get asked was, what did it feel like when the men behaved badly? And I'm you know, getting a bit fed up with that question, because we were there also to negotiate on the constitutional issues, to have agency on police reform, on criminal justice issues, and yet all the media wanted to look at was our agency in terms of being humiliated or insulted every day. So it was really important that we gathered ourselves together and called it out. But it was also really important that we exercised our agency as negotiators, and not just as facilitators and mediators, which we were expected to be. So your issue of agency is, is really important. And too often we're expected to be passive rather than active. Um, as I used to say at our peace table, when one party eventually brought a woman to the table, I said, they might as well have brought a photograph of her, for she never opened her mouth. Um, and that was very sad for me to see, uh, because she wasn't expected to have agency. And I'm certainly sure that she did, and that went on for some time until we pulled the party up. 
and said, you're just doing that because the Women's Coalition are at the table and you want a nicer picture of your own party. But as you know, for opportunistic reasons or whether it's for contagion, contagious reasons, it's good for them to be seen to have to do something. But I wish it wasn't just tokenism. You sat there in the green dress and then I'm, I'm coming to you. Uh, we'll get a microphone to you uh, there. But I'm Hurley and Cork is well represented because I'm from Cork as well. <laughs> um, I was just asking you, the question I was asking is how you go through the process of making up your mind to stand for politics or what is it that, that, that works for you? And I, I ask this question because I, I know of a case many years ago of, of a man who stood, who stood uh, and he, he, was, he was elected to a public uh, position afterwards, but in, in, the, in, the, in, his, in his thought process in the weeks up to running, um, he discussed it with his best friend who was a man, he discussed it with his, with his next door neighbour who was a man, he discussed it with his father and with his father-in-law, he never discussed it with his wife and she only found out by chance from somebody else. And I'm just wondering, who, who, do, you, who do you go to and how, who helps you in your decision making? Is it still his wife? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> my question. Very yeah. good. Good on her. Um, so I, I was a bit different. So um, I was a journalist for 10 years before I became a politician and I worked in the political journalism space uh, and I worked laterally for the, the BBC, which I loved. But I got frustrated because the role of being a journalist, particularly for a, a, a national broadcaster, um, is to be an honest narrator. It is to tell the story that's happening. It's not to be part of the story that's happening. You know, you are not doing your job properly if you insert yourself in that story and divert the course of it. Uh, and the older I got, the more uh, frustrated I was because I wanted to change things in Scotland. I saw things in Scotland that I thought should be changed, could be changed, and changed for the better. Um, and in terms of who I spoke to, um, I spoke to some people within the Conservative Party because I knew I was a Conservative. I wasn't a member of any political party. I'd never been involved in politics. Nobody in my family had ever been a member of a political party. I knew who I voted for. As a journalist, and I was very conscientious, I, I, although many of my colleagues were card-carrying party members for various parties, BBC, none of them Tories, um, I, I, was, I was pretty conscious that I didn't want to ever... I needed to be impartial, but I also needed to be seen to be impartial. So my first point of, co point of contact was talking to a friend's husband, who was a Scottish Conservative MEP at the time. Um, but in terms of family support, actually none, didn't have any. Um, my mother was appalled that I would give up a good four day a week job with a, pe with a pension to try and get elected as a Tory in Glasgow in the 2010s. I mean, like, I can't even tell you how appalled she was at the idea of it. Realistic. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think she thought I was moving back home in my 30s, you know, to, yeah, to live with them because I, I would get, like, it took me two years to get elected, to be fair. Uh, it wasn't an easy ride, but, um, but it was that. It was because there was, it was also, you know, I was, I was kind of 30, I didn't have a mortgage, I didn't have kids, I wasn't in a, a serious long-term relationship. I was like, if I don't jump now, I will never jump. So it was a kind of take a deep breath, commit to it, get it done. And of course I had to leave my job to do it, couldn't do my job, um, and I wouldn't be able to ever go back to news, current affairs and politics. Um, so I, I enrolled to do a master's uh, at university thinking it would take me longer than it did actually to get elected. Um, but yeah, so that's, for me I talked to the party first to make sure that there was a home for me, should I do it. Uh, then I spoke to my family. Um, but mostly I, I, yeah. If people tell me I can't do something, it just makes me want to do it. I'm just one of those people, so yeah, so that was, that was how I did it. Uh, mine was very different. I describe ourselves as accidental activists. Suddenly there were ceasefires. This is what conflict does. It, you're an ordinary woman one day, and extraordinary times happen, and then the peace talks. I was an academic. I was writing about the role of women in politics and the importance of conflict resolution. And indeed, Mary O'Dowd is here, uh, Professor Mary O'Dowd, who was one of my colleagues and she knows that we were writing and there was a lot of scholarship on the importance and then suddenly you're asked, what are you gonna do? And I mentioned this yesterday in the Aris and Nuchteron with the president because they have this exhibition like Women on the Walls, it's called Peace Heroines. And I said, it can be quite individualistic to be a heroine, but we were actually a collective movement. And the point is that we came from previous 
decades of activism. And Mary gathered a lot of that in the Field Day Anthology, which was the first three volumes were all men, writers predominantly, male writers, about politics and history. And along came uh, Mary O'Dowd and others who said, uh, this can't go on. Uh, there needs to be a new anthology. And what we did was we saw the suffragists who had stood for um, the colours of green, uh, white and violet that stand for G, give, uh, W, white, women, violet, the vote. And we suddenly decided we have the vote, we need to organise. We had the networks, which you've just talked about, the pre-existing networks, and it didn't take us as long as you. <laughs> Within six weeks, we were elected. So it was a baptism of fire. But what's my message? Timing is everything. Judgment is everything. But you build on what goes before. Speaking of timing, actually, we have about 10 minutes left. I have three hands. So I have yourself there, I have yourself there, and I have yourself here. So just to put you on notice, I'm going to take you all in a moment. I'm going to take Taya next, then I'm coming to you all, and then we'll have a final uh, session from the panel. All right? If so I say very, very briefly that there are hundreds of ways to become a politician. My mother said always when we were complaining something that that's wrong, she always answered to me that, don't complain, do something for this. And, and so in, the, in a way I learned it already in the family. And um, then when I was at the university, we tried to make a more democratic decision-making system for the Helsinki University, like also the students in France and Germany and so on. We failed, we didn't do it too well. It succeeded 15 years later, but then uh, we got uh, some kind of the reputation and then uh, we have a very strong labor union system in Finland. Uh, and, and so, um, uh, the directors of, of that labor unions, they, they thought that when they needed always lawyers, and I, I have a legal background, so they said that if they can find somebody, uh, the younger ones who could perhaps know also the youth organizations, they, uh, and they said that it, it's not bad if that one is a woman. And, and it happened to me. And then I, I, I was 10 years uh, um, lawyer specialized in, in different kind of the um, safety issues in the working place and also the wildcat strikes, illegal strikes. And, and then I got a reputation that uh, I'm, I'm a good lawyer. And, and then um, our prime minister asked also to have somebody who knows the unions because he didn't know and the young youth organizations. And then I, I served him when I was about 30 or so. Um, it was between this uh, union, union period. I, I, uh, I worked with him and, and then I promised to come back to the unions. But then just by chance, the youth organization said that, could you anyway try to collect a little bit of votes in the parliamentary elections? And I, I said, that, yes, why not? And I was very near, very close to become an MP, but then I, I came back to the unions and the next time I was uh, uh, just uh, got the baby in November. Uh, and, and so uh, when I was in the free from the duties because I, I had this little baby. So again, my friend said that, why not you try to collect a little bit votes? And I did it and, and in, in uh, next March, I was a member of parliament. So, uh, I have had a, in a way, how could I say, I happened to be the right person in the right time in the right place. And then I was uh, 20 years in the parliament and, and the part of that time, I was several places as a minister. So I think that I had never thought that it should be a woman. And my generation didn't think that way. But they say that even you are a woman, you can do that. <laughs> uh, but nowadays, of course, it's a different. You, um, for instance, the young politicians, they underline that they are smart, they are well-dressed and so on. But I will just warn you, the next generation, the teenagers, they say, I don't want to become such kind of the feminist who have the high red heels and so on. I want to do my own way. So I mean the stereotypes, the ways how to be the full woman, it will change all the time. And now with the grandmother of five, I will say that that's fine.
<laughs> I envy you. I really envy you the grandchildren. Okay, so we've five minutes left. We've four people who want to make a point, and then I'm coming back to the panel. I'm starting with you. I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you. I'm com starting with you. Lisa, I'm the CEO of Women for Election. I suppose I'm just to say I'm very privileged to be in the room with such amazing leadership um, women who've led um, so amazingly over, over many decades. So um, great to be a part of the conversation. In Women for Election, we're working to um, get women elected. <laughs> That's, it, says, it does what it says in the tin. And I suppose it's a call all building on the conversation here and building particularly on Monica's last point in terms of all of the decades. Ireland led the world uh, anniversary this Sunday, um, 1919, when um, Candice Markovic was appointed the first ever female minister to cabinet, 2nd of April. And now we're 101st in the world, sitting bottom in Europe. So um, we know the solutions, and, the, and, and, the, and you've, you've dealt with so many of them here this evening. Um, but there's two things. One is a call, to the a call to action for women in the room and women everywhere listening, is we need to take our place back at the table. And, and we need to do that in critical mass. But the second, and it's a question back to the panel, um, men have occupied the seats of the Irish Parliament for over 100 years. 77% of the seats are occupied by men at the moment, and that's the lowest level of occupation ever. How do we get the men of Ireland to know that it's in their best interest that these, these tables are diverse? And how do we get to do that in a way that's actually going to radically shift this glacial pace of change? Okay, I'm going to keep taking the questions and then come back to the panel at the end of all of this, just for the time. Do you have a microphone there already? Uh, so if we can get that, does anybody, there's somebody here with the microphone, yes. I'm getting a microphone to you, sir, it'll be coming to you then, but somebody here has the microphone, don't they? Or I thought you did, sorry. Who's got it? Um, hi. Uh, I'm just wondering, um, how can you more be most effective as a woman? Like, is it more effective to be in the public sector or the civil service or in elected politics? Okay. And yourself, did you get the microphone there? And can we get a microphone to this lady over here? Yes, go on ahead, sir. Um, I've been a foot soldier for Fine Gael all my life, um, and I've canvassed for many candidates, um, mostly men, I must admit. But I have, I have canvassed for women candidates, and believe me, they are no shrinking violets. They are just as, as tough as, as the men were, and rightly so. I, I wouldn't want it to come out from the panel that, um, that um, women are half scared or that, or, or that um, they can't fight their corner. Right. And wasn't it, al that wasn't, it, wasn't it always know. said by, um, by political commentators in the United Kingdom that Margaret Thatcher was the best man in the cabinet? So, yourself so there. I, yes. I might follow on from that. Lorna Kieran, um, Royal College of Surgeons, Public Patient Involvement Manager, just moving to the University of Limerick, where I had the privilege of meeting uh, Professor Yvonne Galligan nearly 27 years ago. And Yvonne, you said that you were in awe of young people, but actually it was us young student leaders that were, on, uh, were in awe of you. And you've inspired a whole generation of, of young women to, to, to grow up and, and to take leadership uh, positions in society. So a very warm thank you and to all of the leaders on the panel for your courage and your, your grace and your dignity and your determination in continuing to stand up for women. Um, my question is about early education because I suppose what I hear a lot on the airwaves um, and what I hear a lot from young people I, I meet is a real disillusionment and a lack of trust in our political structures and a lack of trust, unfortunately, in the human beings who are standing up to become politicians. So I'm wondering if, if any of you have insights to early education, you know, uh, whether it's uh, at, at primary or secondary school, because certainly my experience of being a young student leader, and, and I think my colleague here agrees from Trinity, is that it really gave us an insight and an appreciation into the, the vital importance of those democratic structures. Okay, thank you very much indeed. And so the point about education, the point about bringing men on board, I, I'll start with you, Yvonne, and in a way it's because it's the final commentary for, from all of you, kind of it is about the future, isn't it, and, and where we go from here in terms of education, Yvonne? Um, yes, uh, education has a, an important part to play with it, but I think the, edu the experience while young women and young men, girls and boys are going through education is critical. And this is where I think that things like student councils, for example, in our schools are a very important arena where 
girls and boys learn to be, uh, take their place in that public space and learn to, um, to show leadership and, and these are arenas that foster their leadership and that goes all the way through into universities and um, student leadership uh, in, in that respect as well, standing for various kinds of elections there. But I also think that the larger point of leadership, I think wherever women are in their leadership roles, that that is a very important role to be in. Because any leadership role means that one has influence and one can bring about change. And I think it's reflecting on what as a female leader and indeed men as leaders too, have to reflect on what they, they want to do with this leadership. And I think I would be encouraging all the men to consider in their leadership roles how they support strong women and strong women and men in, of diverse backgrounds. I think the diversity piece is actually really, really important in terms of the output of good decisions for that leadership, be it political leadership, civil society leadership, educational leadership or whatever. And I think important, isn't it, Ruth, as well, to recognise that political leadership is not the same as, you know, being brawny and tough and shouting at people. Political leadership is about a, a kind of a moral courage, a social courage, uh, and that's uh, something maybe as a Conservative that you would see. Yeah, and I'll, I'll tie that to the point that was raised there about where can we be most effective? Is it in elected politics? Is it in the civil service? Is it through business or leading an NGO or whatever? Actually, that depends on you because the most effective leadership of any type is authentic leadership. So where is your passion? Where does it lie? And, and I think particularly when women are leaders in any, any area, particularly that has been male dominated or continues to be male dominated, always remember that younger women in your organization, whatever organization that is, will look to you on how to act. And when you have to show resilience and when you have to show strength, don't ever forget that strength and the toughness you talk about that doesn't have to come at the expense of things like grace and warmth. Because you bring them all together, my God, you can change worlds. And you can change people's minds about what they want to be when they grow up and, and what they see when they look at women leaders in a male-dominated space. A few of those questions in terms of what I saw in South Sudan, I wish I could see more of here. When I come back from those trips uh, with concern, I actually come back with ideas and where concern are building capacity it is in programs called Men Engaging for Women and on International Women's Day and during that whole week I sat under trees and remote camps way out in Bentu where the men were leading the discussions about what was once unacceptable and how they treated women and what was completely now unacceptable and they were doing the role playing and they were doing as showing how things were going to change. Um, I think from my work here, I would love to see more of that. And I would love to see men engaging as champions and, and speaking up. I'll give you examples of that. Um, when in the final week of the peace negotiations, I knew there were a few clauses that we wouldn't get because they were seen to be coming from us. So we gave them to men and the other parties and they put them forward and they were accepted. Um, and they became champions. And I have to say, some of them were inside armed groups at the time, but they became the gentle men at that moment for me because they understood the need that we were trying to push. Um, and it was really important that they, they stood alongside us. So that's, we'll say nothing more about Margaret Thatcher. She actually brought us together as the women's rights movement. We called her Thatcher the milk snatcher. If you remember, she took the, the children's milk away uh, which was really important. It had gone right back to the days of the Boer War when fodder, cannon fodder were sent out to the working class to fight in South Africa and they discovered that they weren't even uh, nutritionally well um, brought up soldiers. And so that's when school milk was introduced and along comes Mrs. Thatcher. She's not indeed. That's a good point to make. That's your point. What are you going to do about it? Um, and I would say that I don't believe there's anything essential about all women being peace builders or peacemakers or good politicians. 
I'm up for the ones who are for progressive change, who want to make that difference and bring other women and men with them in making that change. Um, and I think that's really important. People constantly ask me, Anya, why I am not speaking about all the women leaders doing great stuff. You're probably asked the same thing. It's such a huge expectation. We're not a homogeneous group. We have diversity amongst ourselves. And it's the progressive change that I want to see uh, in making that difference. The early education is where that comes from. Um, and in Northern Ireland now, we're starting a whole movement of politics and action in schools. Uh, and in youth clubs and in organisations. And that's where I'm putting my energy um, because we have great emerging young leaders, but we need to grow them. People constantly say to me, oh, that pride of leadership in the North is terrible at the moment. And I remember us, and I was one of them, I hold up my hand, guilty, as charged when we went to South Africa and met Mandela and I came back totally inspired. And I thought, I wish we had more Mandelas. And then one of the South Africans said, go home and grow them. And I've never forgotten it. Um, and Mandela happens to be a wonderful man. If you have to be locked up with somebody for three days, as we were, it was a good person to be locked up with. But also those brilliant South African women showed me the possibility and the potential for that change. And so that's my message. And you went and grew your leadership uh, from that. And that, I think, is what we see now um, amongst the the younger generation, I hope they have a thirst, which is answering your question, whether it's in the civil service, which is a public service, or whether it's in political life, which is a public service. We are the servants of the people, and we should never forget that. The only difference is that as politicians, the people hold you accountable at every election. And the difference is civil servants advise, politicians get the budgets, and they decide what happens. So there is a huge difference. But I, I think that leader, we have now a head of civil service in Northern Ireland as a woman. The head of the judiciary is a woman. The, head, the attorney general is a woman, the solicitor is a So I could repeat that the institutions and the public servants, we now have role models. And it's good to see them both in political life as well as in uh, as civil servants, servants of the people. Yeah, but this is you all on right, but we have to begin drawing it to a close. President Hallen, and final word from yeah, you. Yeah. Uh, I agree, very wise words by, by, by my, my colleagues here. If I say only that, uh, try to find your passion and, and, and then to work with that. All the sectors of the society are very important and we all have our prejudices. I remember when I got my first female security and then I asked when, when one of them, a lady, uh, said that she's both a nurse, from the hospital, but also the police. And I said, how do you have such kind of the, um, two different kind of the, uh, the uh, education? So she answered, it's perhaps my, because of my father. I said, oh, well, your father was a police. No, he was a nurse. And, and so I mean that we all have this. And, and all the role models are very important. But then I will say also that uh, if you ask the political leadership, so it's, uh, it's all of uh, listening. It's also the skill to make the compromises. To make a skill to make a compro compromises and to see the target. Because it's very, very seldom that you get it at once. And we have here already, <laughs> we have uh, gotten cited by Mao. <laughs> it's interesting concerning that, uh, that alone you go faster, but uh, together you are stronger. And it's another, another one, which is funny that when we are now here in Ireland, I say that even the biggest match start with one step. So, so, so it is really, and, and I'm, I'm fully confident with the future in that way that both uh, women and men will find their new roles. And it's, it's good to re remind our men that you have to find your role by yourself. And we promise to support you that you will make a smart decisions <laughs> in the same way what you have done with us. And, and I think that that's a lot to do, but um, we, in that historical uh, moment we live now, we need the experience of the men and the women. Perhaps in future, our grand grandchildren will say that, why are you taught that the gender is so important? If it's more democratic society, perhaps the differences are not so big, but today it is, and perhaps still also tomorrow. So we need both men and women.
Let's see. Give them a round of applause. Thank you all so much. It was lovely. Thank you. Oh, it great. Enjoyed it. Thank you very much. What a really interesting evening. I'd like to thank each of the four speakers, President Hallin, Professor McWilliams, Baroness Davidson, Professor Galligan. You know, there's a phrase used a lot to promote female sports in Ireland. You know, if you want to see it, you have to be it. Or if you want to be it, you have to see it. Maybe I'll get it right the second time around. And certainly that is all about role models. And what four fantastic, not just female role models, but actually role models per se we have had the real challenge and, and experience to listen to this evening. I really enjoyed it so much. We valued your insights, your experience, your stories, and I think your passion for what you've been involved in has really shone through. And as ever, Anya, thank you so much for your superb moderation. Thank you very much. And so again, some housekeeping duties. The next Academy Discourse will take place on the 10th of May at 6 p.m. here in Academy House with Professor Philip Nolan, MRIA, the Director General of Science Foundation Ireland. Details on how to book will be available on the Academy website, www.ria.ie, in due course. To those of you who have joined us online, thank you very much. You can now have a nice evening. But for those who of you who are here, I'd like to, to join members and, council, members and uh, guests for some refreshments in the members and council room. And thank you very much. Thank you very much.